Isn't the presence and invitation of Christ enough for St. Peter to walk without wavering on the stormy sea of Galilee? Well, evidently not. St. Peter and the other apostles are afraid, thinking they're seeing a ghost. Then St. Peter calls out for a blessing to leave the boat and walk with Christ. Then he becomes afraid again, and Peter begins to sink, and Jesus calls him a man of little faith, asking, why are you doubting? And that's the question, why, why are we doubting? Why do we doubt? There can be a healthy doubt, but there's an unhealthy doubt as well. And the faithful church can learn much from St. Peter. <clears throat> Well, the reality is this, that Peter, and this is true for all followers of Christ, no matter their age or what age that they live in, wasn't prepared for a sustained walk on the water with Christ. His soul, his thinking, his understanding is still informed by his fallen human nature. We find ourselves in that place very often. He's taken over by his, his fear, by his uncertainty. So by doing that, he refuses to enter into the very miracle, the very reality that Christ Jesus is calling him into. So those soul-deep pathways, as it were, have not been connected and reconnected enough over time in order for him to have that sustained walk with Christ in that situation. Yet for a moment, he lets go of his preconceptions and his notions of what reality is. And at that moment, he lets go of his troubled soul and his ideas of how the world actually works. And he does walk on the water. But then he loses that focus, he loses his understanding of who Christ is and what is actually happening here, and he refuses to enter into God's reality. Well, sometimes we actually have to come to our true senses, and our true sense would be to find ourselves in the reality of God, to enter into and abide in God's reality. Remember what happened to the prodigal? He came to his senses, he came to his right mind. So what about a significant event like a, a miracle? We're looking out onto a, a, a wonderful vista of unimaginable beauty, or even a tragedy that has the power to momentarily awake us to reality and invite us to change for the good, to desire to live in God's reality. A significant event like that helps us in our understanding of God and how God behaves in the world. We know that God is with us. But this doesn't last, usually. Why? Because the changing for the good, the way we focus, what we focus on, how we understand the world in light of Christ, how we act, can't be accomplished unless we have a prolonged effort. There's a practice, a prolonged practice. Anybody here ever been to the Olympics? about a chess master, pianist, musician, scholar. It just, just came easily, right? Didn't have to do anything about it. There was no practice involved. It just happened. We're not built that way. We're not created that way. God wants us to be able to practice. That's what the life in Christ is. It's the ascetic life. It's the life of practice. And so when these big events happen, we're there for a moment, 
and then it's gone. It's over with, which is what happened to St. Peter. So he's called as entering into this miracle of the Savior of the world. The Messiah has come, he even commands the wind and the waves. And then he walks on the water, but then he falls back to his old patterns of understanding how the world will hang, hang on. I've been in wind and waves before, and you always sink, you don't walk on the water. But this miraculous, this extraordinary, the very presence of God, of Christ, invites us beyond those worldly thoughts, those worldly understandings, that worldly focus. As one Christian writer said, and I like the way he put this, walk into a dark field at night where there are no lights to distract you. For a moment there is a break in the incessant noise of thought. You are amazed. The beauty astounds you. For a moment, a beautiful telling moment, there is no worldly thought, only vision. We see reality undistracted by our finite thinking. And then that little voice speaks within us. Aha, that's the Milky Way. I actually know what a star is. I learned that in school. I know what stars are. And pretty soon you'll be thinking, when you wish upon a star, or thinking of a planetarium you once visited as a child, or going out for an ice cream cone, or whatever else comes to mind. And in a split second, the Milky Way and the wonder you experienced are replaced by a concocted dream and a fantasy that only peripher peripherally has anything at all to do with what you are experiencing. This is what happened to Peter. He lost his focus on this miraculous event and the divine person before him and got lost in his familiar, fearful thoughts, emotions, and worldly understanding of God's creation and God's power over creation. Ever been there? Ever had that go on in your life? That you were taken up and then all of a sudden mind goes and you're off to the races again. But when we're faithfully focused on the reality of Christ, especially as St. Peter was called to enter the reality of Christ, the reality of Christ is, I'm walking on the water. Yes or no, that's, that's God's reality at that moment. <laughs> and he says, you know, can I come out, you know? Yes. So you're entering God's reality. But there's a fight that goes on within us. The liar, the tempter comes to us and says, no, that's not right. You can't walk on water, you sink. You've been in water before, you know what happens. And so it goes on and on. And then all of a sudden, we're not focusing on God's reality, we're focusing on what's going on in our mind. So we need more practice. Practice makes perfect, as they say. So I don't want us to get the idea that this goal of spiritual practice is to deny reality, because if you walk off the end of the dock, you're going to go in the water. That is the reality as created in this world, the creation that God has created. But when God calls us to walk on the water, that's God's reality. And that's greater than we can ever ask or imagine. But only if that be God's will. So don't go testing God by trying to play with poisonous snakes and think that God will protect you. No, that's tempting God. So we don't deny delusion and the spiritual practice, but with the faith of Christ, we can abide in God's reality which he calls each and every one of us to. And for Peter, that reality was to walk on water. St. Paul says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. The, the word is actually your noose. 
which is what's the focus of your soul? Refocus what you are focusing on. Refocus your understanding and, and look for God's reality, God's will. To be able to, by God's grace, the power of the Holy Spirit working within you, to take you beyond our limited human understanding and our own fallen delusions to where God would have us be, according to God's will and according, according to God's timing. But that takes practice. How do we practice? The spiritual life is the life of prayer. We'll say a little bit more about that shortly. But our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, our actions can all be rewired as it were, to follow God's will and God's way, which means to live in God's reality. And Christ is always calling us to walk on our water, whatever that might be. There's always the small miracles in this life that God is calling us into and to respond to him. To walk in his way, to walk in his reality, even when there's still fear. And yes, we'll still feel fear. But the courage of Christ is to continue on, even in that fear, knowing that God is with us. And we accomplish all of this by diligent, repeated communion with God that we call prayer. Prayer is speaking with, talking with God. That's what prayer is, communion with God. And over time and with practice, which begins and ends with prayer, begins and ends with communion with God, the Lord shows us his way because he is the way. And he empowers us with grace to walk along and then sometimes calls us to step outside the boat. We don't change overnight in this. It's not how we're created again. But through diligent prayer, meditation, contemplation on who God is. And with the faith of Christ within. That will reveal to us who God is. How God is calls us to act in the world. What is God's reality? We will find in the silence of prayer. But there's no sounds. There's no voices. There's no images. And your imagination takes a small break. will enter into the reality of God. That's why Peter is able to walk for a time. For a moment he enters into the reality of Christ. True communion and union with God in God's reality lifts us entirely out of this passing world into the available power and infinite wisdom and understanding of God. But Peter then reconsiders his human wisdom and begins to sink. So we must commune with God always, pray in silence with few words, and concentrate on living only in the moment. This is the way that leads to the truth and the life. Practice. Isn't the liturgy practice? You ever thought of that that way? I bet you with this number of people here, if all the books were burnt, everything was finished over, and everything that was written as far as liturgies, the scriptures was taken away, you would be amazed and shocked at how much this little group of people would be able to bring together. But you could do the whole liturgy without having the book in front of you. And if somebody forgot something, another person would come up with the word that was missing. See, but that's the practice 
We enter into God's presence again and again. We enter into God's reality because God has called the church into the reality of God's worship. That's what the liturgy is. We're following, in a sense, the same liturgy that the ancient Jewish folk followed. We've added to that the Lord's Supper, the Holy Eucharist. We're practicing here. So do not forsake your practicing. That's why we can't practice out on the golf course instead of coming to the liturgy. So back to Peter, back to Christ. This calm and peaceful walk, at least for a moment with Peter, amidst the storms, that focuses in on the eternal storms that rage within us and outside of us. I can't imagine what the people in Hawaii are going through. Their lives are decimated. What's the meaning of this? Where's God in this? Well, the reality remains God is with us. God is with us, even in the horrid storms of life, and is willing to lift us out by the eternal power, the grace of God. I'm just going to quickly look here at prayer. There are stages in prayer. Some people say, I don't progress in my prayer life. And often it's because they don't get past kind of the first step. The first step in prayer is to be quiet, be silent. Go to a place that's quiet, and even if you hear noise outside from the world, that's okay. Just let that go by. Be silent. The focus within. The kingdom of God is within not out there. That's why the sounds of this world are not there and able to invade onto our communion with God. We go inside and sit patiently. We do this faithfully no matter what. And after a time, according to God's timing, there will be a great space that opens up within us. That's why we have to practice. Pray always, the Apostle says. And then that peace and calm opens up within us. Remember, St. Peter failed at first. That's okay. He cried out to the Lord, and the Lord lifted him up. And that's how contemplative prayer happens, with persistence, with practice, with checking out with a spiritual mentor, how I'm progressing. As one saint said, the storm is no match for the Holy Spirit and the persistent prayer. The place of peace and calm, as this gospel demonstrates, is exemplified in the person of Christ. Where he is, there is perfect peace. Where he is, there is the kingdom. There is eternity. Where he is, storms no longer matter. Waves are no longer overcoming, and the wind is revealed to be the stirring of the Holy Spirit, and any torrential rains become a new baptism, making us into new people, remaking us and fashioning us into the very likeness of God. So we must dive into God, is within, the kingdom is within. To walk on the water, we must dive within ourselves. And there we will find the light, as Thomas Merton, the mystic, said, a door opens in the center of our being, and we seem to fall through into the immense depths, which, although they are infinite, are actually accessible to us all. We come to understand that all eternity has become ours 
in the presence of Christ. This is accessible to everyone. And Jesus told us how. But you, when you pray, enter into your closet. And when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. The closet is a metaphor, meaning the heart, the soul. And closing the door is meaning shut out the senses. Yes, you'll hear noises outside when you pray. Don't be concerned about it. If the phone rings, let it go. In secret means the need for solitude, stillness and silence. That's where Peter started. He was in the peace, the reality of God within his soul. And then his mind took over and said, are you crazy? This is impossible. But Christ Jesus says to you and to me and to every person, with God all things are possible according to God's will. This is how we must pray. This is how Jesus prayed even before he went on the water, if you remember. <clears throat> Do this, and you and I will be learning how to actually walk on water. Any water that God calls us to walk upon. 